Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Low Carbon Learning Since Sophia's webinar. My name is Sarah Buchanan, and I'm going to be your host for today's webinar. We should last for about an hour and a half in the session, and we're going to hear from three amazing speakers. I'm delighted to welcome Sarah Lewis from the Passive House Trust, James Parker from Expedition Engineering, and Alistair Kidd from East Ayrshire Council. I will do a little bit of an introduction to each of our speakers um, as I introduce them. Um, unfortunately, Alistair does have to leave for another meeting today, but we have Magnus Dowie from East Ayrshire Council, who is going to answer all the questions in the question and answer session. So before I give you a little bit of an introduction to Built Environment Smarter Transformation and the Low Carbon Learning Programme, we have the obligatory housekeeping, as with all webinars these days. So just to let you know, the session will be recorded and available on our YouTube channels early next week. We'd love for you to get involved, to ask questions and leave your comments. It's really important. So you can do that in the box on the right hand side. If you just click on the questions on the control panel, and type in your questions and press send. Unfortunately, you won't be able to verbally ask the questions, but I'll monitor and go through the questions at the end. And if we don't get to any today, we will come back to you for uh, any questions that we don't answer. Your feedback is extremely important to us, so please do fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. It just lets us know what our content's like. We want our webinars to be valuable and add benefits, so any comments that you have are, are really important to us. There will also be a couple of polls today, so get involved. Um, the questions will come up on your screen and you've got about 30 seconds to answer and then I can uh, take you through the, the polls. So just as a bit of an introduction to BEST, who we are, Built Environment Smarter Transformation. We are formerly Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, it's a bit of a mouthful. And our uh, reason um, uh, for existing is to support industry, academia and the public sector to innovate and collaborate. And how we do that is we accelerate the built environment's transition to net zero. So anyone who works in the built environment who wants to create a new product, process, business or service can come to the centre, can get advice, signposting. We provide future skills training. We've got an amazing factory in Blantyre with lots of equipment that companies can come and access. So please, if you haven't been on the tour, come along. I'd love to show you around. Uh, we also provide funding to projects, we enable knowledge exchange, and we also uh, make uh, collaborations with the right academic partners. Clearly, decarbonisation is a huge challenge. We've got extremely uh, vigorous uh, carbon emission reductions targets, which you'll hear more about from our speakers, that we need to uh, achieve in the next two decades. And a lot of the buildings that already exist, um, how are we going to enable this massive engineering project over the next few years? Retrofit is going to play a huge part of that. So what we do is we champion best practice for retrofit. We run training programmes. We enable industry and academics to work together. And as part of that, Low Carbon Learning was a programme that's been funded through the National Transition Training Fund. It's the first of its kind in Scotland to cover Passive House and Enerfit, which is a globally recognised approach for the design, construction and retrofit of highly energy efficient buildings. Training is completely free to attend and it was a mixture of practical online training in the factory. And of course, we do webinars and there's lots of online content. Um, a fabric and structure programme was recently added to the offering. So there's guidance around um, how to do design decisions can influence energy consumption, as well as a carbon accounting module, if any of you have looked at that. And of course, the need for environmental data to be calculated for each project. So, so far, we have um, 500 people who have been through the training, 1,600 um, have completed online programmes, and 45 individuals have received accreditation for the work that they've done. And we've engaged with 70 businesses and 40 education providers. So if your business or if you're working in the public sector and you're looking for help with retrofit, if you're looking for training, either practical skills training or you would like to deliver a webinar, then we are here to support. So please do uh, get in touch with us. So I'll move on before I introduce our first speaker. Um, I'll move on to our first poll. Um, so retrofitting existing buildings is obviously fraught with uncertainties and constraints. There's a lot to consider. What, in your opinion, is the most important consideration? Is it the budget? Um, is it the planning? 
are the occupants going to be in the building when you do the project? That obviously has a huge impact, as well as uh, kind of tenant engagement. Um, is it the types of construction? It's just to really get a sense from everyone um, at the start of the webinar what you what your thoughts are. Um, obviously, there's a lot more that could have been added to this section, but we we went with the name, the main considerations. So, what do you feel is the most important? And the results um, should come up in the next couple of seconds. Yeah, so obviously it's the, the type of construction in the building, which obviously has such a huge impact. And hopefully by the end of the presentations, um, you'll have um, a much clearer understanding of, of where to start. Thank you for that. OK, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is Alistair Kidd, Architecture and Projects Manager at East Ayrshire Council. Alistair joined the council in 2001, and he has primary role for consideration of the capital investment programmes at the council. He's developed a significant interest in low energy, zero carbon design solutions, which includes Passive House and Enerfit. And of course, um, he's looking after the Pathfinder projects, which since the years is, is part of the UK's first Enerfit deep retrofit of a primary school. And it's happening here in Scotland, which is fantastic. Um, over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Sarah. Um, just to explain, my, my webcam um, isn't working. So <laughs> unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see me. So um, I'm sure that's not a loss to many of you. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Alistair Kidd. I'm the Joint Senior Project Manager for the Saints of Eyes Project for East Ayrshire Council, along with my colleague Magnus Dewey. Uh, before Sarah and James provide you with more detail on uh, Enerfit and embodied carbon retrofit solutions, I'd like to give you some background and context to the Saints of Eyes Project. Um, originally, our intentions were to complete a typical refurbishment of the St. Sophia's Primary School to improve its condition and to some degree suitability, with the aim of extending the building's current lifespan by 20 years or more. Whilst developing the proposals back in 2019, our team felt that the project presented us with a unique opportunity to consider alternative approaches to refurbishment that had the potential to drastically reduce our energy demands whilst also making a positive contribution to our Council's climate change aspirations. Following some research, this led, to us, uh, this led us to the conclusion that the building could be retrofitted to an Enerfit standard within the available budget allocation. This provided us with the opportunity not only to address future operational efficiency, but also an immediate and su substantial saving in embodied carbon by utilising the existing structure rather than building new. For those of you that don't know, Enerfit is the name given to a similar passive house building standard when applied to existing buildings. Typically, Enerfit standards are incorporated into deep retrofit projects on existing buildings and will incorporate high levels of continuous insulation combined with airtight membranes to transform the energy efficiency of an existing building. To gain Enerfit certification, the EUI for heating and cooling must be reduced to 25 kilowatts per hour uh, kilowatts per hour per meter square per annum or less. Next slide, slide please, Sarah. St. Sophia's Primary School is a small 1950s building located in Goldstone, Ayrshire, serving the denominational catchment of the urban valley. The existing building was rated as being in a C condition as per the most recent school estate management plan and has a current role of 95 pupils. The building is made up of a number of single and two-storey elements that incorporate a number of level changes that detrimentally impact on accessibility and usability of the internal spaces. The building itself sits within a site of approximately 1.8 acres, with access to the school currently down a steep access road. Existing classrooms also have limited direct access to external spaces. Next slide, please, Sarah. Delivering a, a deep retrofit to an Enerfit standard will, to all intents and purposes, result in a new school, albeit working within the existing footprint and structure. All internal and external spaces will be extensively refurbished, with significant improvements in terms of the energy performance of the building and its carbon emissions overall. The project also gives us the opportunity to rationalise and improve the existing layout of the building in terms of its suitability to ensure this is fit for purpose and remains aligned with 21st century learning and teaching. 
as well as extensively refurbishing the existing building and constructing some minor extensions to improve accessibility and enhance learning and teaching spaces, the project also aims to make some improvements to external areas. This includes the relocation of the main entrance, improvements in public realm spaces, including the creation of a new visitor car park and accessible walkway and enhanced teaching spaces directly accessible from all classrooms. Next slide, please, Sarah. The Innofit refurbishment of St. Sophia's Primary School has presented East Ayrshire Council with an exciting opportunity to pilot and test these new building techniques, with the aim of these being replicated on future refurbishment projects. A recent climate change strategy approved by East Ayrshire Council in June 2021 underpinned this commitment with a key priority being the adoption of a fabric first approach to the refurbishment of existing buildings on a basis that is consistent with the principles of Innofit. Opportunities such as the migration to zero, net, zero direct emissions heating solutions, incorporation of renewable technologies and on-site energy generation, supported by the whole-scale adoption of the new net zero public sector building standard, are also being embraced by the Council as a means of supporting our commitment to achieve net zero by 2030. The Innofit refurbishment of St. Sophia's Primary School is not only an exciting opportunity for East Ayrshire Council's team to pilot and test new building techniques that we can then replicate on future refurbishment projects, but it's the first Innofit refurbishment of its type in the UK. It provides us with a unique opportunity to share learning across the public sector in Scotland, and we've been working with organisations such as the Scottish Futures Trust, Zero Waste Scotland, Passive House Trust and BEST to try and maximise learning opportunities. Over the last few months, East Ayrshire Council's team have also been assessing options for establishing a destination modelling toolkit based on an Innerfit informed approach for all of our existing buildings that will provide us with a robust statewide action plan and capital, a capital investment requirements. This is a complex challenge as existing buildings have greater limitations in terms of delivering low energy solutions, resulting in a different approach needing to be adapted and adopted for different building types and constructions. To support this work, East Ayrshire Council, together with a number of other local authorities, including City of Edinburgh, Perth and Kinross and Fife Councils, have established a collaborative working group to try and develop a standardised approach for determining the most cost efficient and cost effective solutions in terms of building refurbishment based on the Innerfit principles, which in turn will allow councils to make informed investment decisions across their entire estate. There is a real willingness amongst our community of local authorities to learn, and we would encourage any like-minded colleagues to get in contact with us if they are interested in sharing in the work that we are doing. Lastly, um, it should be acknowledged that whilst the Council's own team promoted the delivery of the St. Sophia's project and Innofit standard, we needed support from experts in this field. To do this, East Asia Council procured the services of Hamson Baron Smith, and in particular Sarah Lewis who had a proven track record of delivering similar Innerfit projects and has been instrumental in supporting East Ayrshire Council get the project to the state that it is currently at. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Sarah, um, who will obviously then um, uh, take the presentation on to Sarah. Thank you, Alistair. Um, that was a really great introduction to the project and uh, it's just really fantastic to hear how engaged uh, Easter Couch or Council have been in this process and this um, the collaborative working group that they're now in with other local authorities. It feels like the impact that this group could have and the wider adoption of these kind of statewide plans is really, really significant. So I'm going to take you guys through to about 10 to 3, talking through um, initially just a very quick bit of the kind of UK context. And then I'm going to introduce Enerfit as a standard before I get into some of the details around what we're actually doing at St. Sophia's. Um, and then I'm going to hand over it to James, who's going to talk us through some more of the embodied carbon, whole life carbon and circular economy aspects around the project as well. Uh, so just starting with the UK context, the IPCC identified the CO2 pathway that we need to follow to get to net zero. 
So on the graph here, that's our red line. And note, this line is steeper than the route we took to get to where we are today, and that's the green line. So we definitely cannot wait around, um, waiting around for the next 10 years for technology to provide us with solutions or even sitting around and consulting on policy. We just need to act now, and we do have tools available to allow us to do that. And how our buildings fit into this big picture? Well, they contribute 23% of our emissions in the UK. 16% alone come from our homes, so a major part of our footprint. We also know that the majority of our buildings are pretty wasteful and inefficient, so critically, buildings are an area where significant savings could be made. And whilst it's really important to ensure that our new buildings are as efficient as possible, and for that, of course, we've already got our suite of passive house new build standards, Standards, our existing buildings really are by far the biggest part of the problem. The UK has some of the oldest and least energy efficient stock in the whole of Europe and 80% of the buildings that are going to be around in your portfolios in 2050 or 2045 in Scotland um, have already been built. So while my presentation today is going to focus on energy reduction and also a little bit on the health improvements possible through retrofit, it's also worth mentioning that huge embodied carbon saving that is delivered by retrofitting rather than rebuilding. And as I mentioned, James is going to talk a bit more about that aspect of the Sense Fires project shortly. Um, we really must be responsible with our finite resources and we've really got to always think whenever we're thinking about a new building actually is there a retrofit option instead is there a building that could do this for us so I want to take a moment just to highlight some really useful retrofit guidance available from the Passive House Trust website. It's all uh, free to download. So firstly, our Passive House Trust position paper on retrofit in the UK and our new kind of four page primer, which kind of gives a quick but comprehensive overview of all the issues that we cover in that more detailed um, guidance and research paper. Then last year, we also launched a new tool for use with the Passive House software PHVP, and that's to assist in accurately calculating energy use in our existing buildings. It's called the Periodic Heating Tool and again that's free to download with some guidance on how to, to use it uh, from the Trust website. Okay so Passive House um, has has uh, or Enofit, the Passive House Retrofit Standard as Alistair introduced it as, um, it has the same five kind of principles as a Passive House new build building. So you still have to have a continuous thermal envelope. You need to be able to manage solar gain to maximize the solar gain when you want it in the winter and minimize the solar gain um, that might result in overheating in the summer. You need to get thermal bridge free as far as is practically possible. And we're going to look at some of the challenges that retrofit um, poses in that regard. You again need to get a draft free envelope. So the building effectively needs to be airtight. There is a slight relaxation from the passive house new build standard, um, but it's still a really, really challenging target. So the airtightness um, strategy for a retrofit project is an absolute key thing to get uh, right. And then, of course, in a passive house, we need that healthy, filtered, fresh air supplied to all the habitable spaces in the building. Um, using mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And for all passive house buildings, whether it's a new build or a retrofit project, you need to be modeling your project using the PHPP, so the passive house planning package. Um, and you can, there's a link there where you can get a copy of that from the Passive House Institute. It's a really excellent tool. It's an energy balance modeling tool, and it's really good because what it does very well, it predicts uh, performance in use. So we get a really good correlation between our, our design planning stage and performance in use. And that is one of the reasons we're seeing such a big uptake of Passive House um, under the LEAP program because of the requirement for post-completion performance. And Passive House is a tool that we have that we know is able to deliver this. And this is just to say it is a worldwide standard. So this is the kind of Enerfit map because the Enerfit um, space heat demand target uh, changes depending on where you are in the world. So we are obviously over here at St. Sophia's, which puts us in the cool temperate zone in terms of our Enerfit targets. 
So there are a couple of different ways you can approach an NFA project, and I just want to highlight what these ways are now. So the first method for NFA certification is shown on the screen at the moment, and this is the single stage heat demand method. And this covers all projects where the retrofit work is going to be undertaken as a single project, and the outcome is that you're getting that space heating demand reduced to that um, typically 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum, along with the other certification criteria. So this is the approach that we've taken at Sinsophias. Um, but for complete list, I'm just going to summarize the other method that we have available to us. So um, the Anafit standard can also be delivered through the component method. And this doesn't refer to certified pacifiers components, but rather the kind of component parts that make up the building. So, for example, walls, roofs, floors, and of course, your windows and doors. Um, but rather than set a specific space heating demand target, like the first method, this alternative approach sets limits for the thermal performance of those building elements alongside the same targets for air tightness, ventilation and surface temperature, which means that we're able to um, really control the comfort and health within the building. The reason this option was introduced for Enerfit buildings was to cater for buildings where the orientation, the form factor or the existing glazing ratios preclude achieving that required space heating demand target, even once you've got the fabric upgraded to levels that are kind of equal to passive house performance. So it's for those really challenging projects. Um, and while there's obviously no specific space heating demand associated with the component approach, experience in the UK is indicating it typically delivers in the range of 30 to 40 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. And we're seeing that used increasingly on projects, especially when you've got challenges around um, historic facades and things like that. And then for various reasons, it might just not be practical to deliver an NFIT as a single stage project. So a lot of you in that poll were saying that you um, were your top concern was the occupants of the building. And of course, that has to be um, a key consideration right at the beginning of the project when you decide on the strategy for how you're approaching your retrofit. And if you've got residents in situ, you might be considering a staged retrofit. Um, and that's why the Pacifiers Institute launched the step-by-step -step approach in 2016. And that can be used with either of the two methods I just outlined. So the energy demand or the component method. So this, um, obviously it's a given that in time building components are going to need to be replaced, but it's not gonna happen all at the same time, but instead as they reach the end of their lifespans. So this approach ensures that we don't just do a kind of like for like replacement with these old components, but whilst there's an opportunity present, we improve their efficiency right up to NRFIT levels and in turn prevent something we refer to as the lock-in effect. And I'm going to explain a bit more in the next slide. But the aim of this approach is very much to allow individual retrofit measures to be implemented over an agreed period of time, which might be years or even decades, although we don't have decades if you've got a 2030 uh, zero carbon target. Um, for this approach to be successful, a full overview of the project from start right through to completion really needs to be undertaken. And that ensures that those high levels of energy efficiency are going to be achieved. It also helps to keep costs to a minimum by avoiding abortive work. And it makes sure that the project can avoid unintended consequences by planning everything up front. So that term I mentioned, lock-in, is used to refer to this rising issue where moderate levels of building performance improvements are made on retrofit projects. Because once these have taken place, it would be super unsustainable, uneconomical, and of course very impractical to then change them again, which leads to these buildings underperforming performing to the substandard level for the next 30 or 40 years. So we need to be future-proofing energy levels. And every single thing we do to a building today should be part of a journey to our zero carbon targets. And certainly a mixture of these approaches is going to be required when we start to look at how local authorities address their holy state to meet that 2030 or 2040 um, climate commitment that's being made. And I've included this graphic from a report published by Archetype. Um, late last week, I think it was, on achieving uh, zero carbon estates, which looks at the work that they've been doing with Edinburgh City Council and others to look at the decarbonisation of their non-domestic estates using a kind of NRFIT informed retrofit plan. Um, and there's a link on the screen there for anyone wishing to read the full um, blog post, which is up on their website. But okay, as our project today is a single stage NRFIT, this is a quick uh, spot the NRFIT challenge for you, or the um, I guess that's a little bit easy, but I put this this slide up as it's worth highlighting that this project dates back um, to when I was working at Bear Architects in 2000, 
uh, and so 10, 11, it completed in 2011. So it's over a decade old. So at that point, we were already looking at ways that we could get 80% carbon savings um, in social housing using Enefit as an approach. So these are not new ideas. And similarly, this is another project I worked on around the same uh, time, and it was to become the UK's first non-domestic passive house retrofit. It's a pioneer again, and it's over a decade old, and post-occupancy um, post -occupancy evaluation shows that the total energy demand was reduced by 85%. And the cost, this is the bit I find very interesting, the cost of upgrading this building all the way to passive house standard, rather than just upgrading the building to basic building regulation compliance, was just 7%. So it shows that a huge amount of cost is in just doing the work. So for example, replacing windows is expensive, but the uplift from sort of double glazed building right compliant windows to fully triple glazed pacifies windows was a lot less significant. So this really highlights that when we're doing the work anyway, we must do it to the very best standard we can to get real value out of the process. If we'd only met building regulations back in 2010, this building would be ready for another retrofit today, which just shows how unsustainable that approach really is. Okay, and then this takes us right back up to present day with today's case study at St. Sophia's. And of course, these graphics are really showing why Passive House is so important because it focuses on fabric improvements, which tackles the big energy consumer in our existing buildings, and that's space heating demand, which you can see on that pie chart on the left there. So that's the energy split at the moment at St. Sophia's, that big chunk of the pie that's all space heating. And that's what Enerfit reduces so well. So you can see on the right there, that bar chart is showing that um, we've got a predicted 88% reduction on the metered energy use at St. Sophia's. And of course, there's this added benefit that by focusing on these fabric improvements, coupled with the Enerfit requirement to optimize that fresh air, results in incredibly healthy and comfortable indoor conditions that provide really excellent learning environments. Um, and I'm just going to show a couple of slides to demonstrate the kind of health effects and um, before we get into some of the details. So uh, this graph, which is using data uh, sourced through Archetype, um, is looking at the seasonal CO2 levels in three different types of schools. I feel like we used to always have to describe what the CO2 levels were, but with COVID, everyone became very conscious of CO2 just being a very good proxy for indoor air quality. So it's, an, it's something that's easy for us to measure, and it's a really good proxy for how fresh the air is. Um, so you can see here that we've got, let me see if I can get this to come up right, there we go. So we've got the passive house school here, which peaks below 1500 um, parts per million, but actually is almost always below 1000 parts per million, which is really healthy level of uh, air quality. The building regulation compliance school, which was monitored, peaks um, above 4000 parts per million. And the 1970s school is even higher at around 5000 parts per million. Um, the blue dotted heat line here um, was the recommended limit. I think that has been reduced now down to sort of a thousand parts per million. So that's that's showing that the passive house construction really provides that healthy indoor air quality. It is the most appropriate standard we have to meet the current air quality guidance, but also that proposed guidance. And indeed, it's probably already been helping protect passive house occupants um, from the, the COVID um, infection that we were dealing with in the last couple of years. Okay, this is a really good graph to get your head around, so I'm going to talk you through it in a second, but there is a lot of evidence that points to the need for good air quality, good thermal comfort and a quiet environment for really optimal learning and optimum performance, um, both at school and at work. And these are all elements which are really central to and delivered by the Pacify standard. So research presented in this graphic suggests that human brain, uh, the human brain is very sensitive to changes in CO2 levels, noticeably so at levels um, above 2,500 parts per million. So think back to our previous graph for a moment. Um, where we had the building regulation compliance school peaking around 4,000 parts per million um, and the 1970 school even higher at uh, 5,000 parts per million. Um, so just to give you all the time to digest this graphic, we have um, typical cognitive activities along the bottom and our, our ability to fulfill these is categorized from superior at the top of the page down to dysfunctional at the bottom. 
The white dots um, are, and the white lines show uh, CO2 at 600 parts per million, so kind of typical passive house school levels. The blue um, are at 1,000 parts per million, and the black are at 2,500 parts per million. So just know how many of our cognitive functions are marginal or even dysfunctional at 2,500 parts per million. And remember, what I was saying, the building regulation in 1970s school topped out at 4,000 and 5,000 parts per million, respectively. With reviews of similar studies reaching similar conclusions, CO2 does seem to have an effect on cognitive performance. So we really have to question how suitable our learning spaces really are when we're not provided that dedicated fresh air supply. And a final note on health before we get into details. Um, schools um, in sort of in schools where you have kind of excessive noise, um, there's been shown to be interference with children's learning. So SIBSI TM40 explains that the um, explains the evidence that we have of detrimental effects on children's cognitive performance is very strong, particularly in relation to schools exposed um, to noise from air traffic. And this affects, uh, the effects of this include things like deficits in attention, poor speech development, and poor memory. The results um, of all of this kind of results in affecting the children's overall capabilities. So for example, in a school study, the mean reading age of children in classrooms exposed to high level of noise was found to be three to four months behind that of control, um, the control school or the control children. And the effects, um, these effects are sustained over time if that exposure to the environmental noise continues. So again, passive house um, tends to provide very acoustically separated spaces because of the triple glazed window, air tightness and thermal insulation. Okay, so now we're gonna run through how the team, um, Hampson, Baron and Smith uh, with East Ayrshire Council and Baker Hicks um, and with input from Flemings, uh, who are the contractors for the project, have addressed each of these kind of five passive house principles that we discussed at the start. So if you remember, that was continuous thermal insulation, solar gain, thermal bridge reconstruction, that draft reconstruction, and also fresh air. So you can see those images on the left. Alistair also showed you some of the existing school. And the strategy here was really to retain as much of that existing superstructure and substructure as possible. And that was really um, a way to make the most of the embodied carbon of that existing building and minimize the embodied carbon of the project, but also not have to pay to rebuild the parts of the building which were still doing their job. But to get to the Pacify standard, we really need to make sure that envelope is doing everything it can for us. And one of the things we look at with Pacify's buildings is what we refer to as the form factor. And that is a ratio of the external envelope of a building to the internal um, floor area. So you can see there that the existing school was at 3.8 um, as a form factor. So we were trying to get down to our target of less than three. It was quite ambitious. But what we were doing to do that was we were trying to rationalize the building envelope. So where there were bits on that existing gray um, building up in the corner, you can see. Um, so this, this bit over here, that's the existing building. There's all these kind of ins and outs and many different roofs and things. So we were just trying to smooth out the envelope, which was helping us with the amount of heat loss through the fabrics for reducing the external envelope. But it was also reducing complexity because we're all about trying to make sure that the building is buildable. The designs are buildable at the end and we don't want lots of complex junctions, which are difficult to, um, to realize on site. So those are a couple of the different options. We went through lots of option restorations early on in the project. The one we settled on was somewhere between these two and the form factor was around 3.3. So a huge improvement on the existing, um, not quite as low as the idealized target. This is an example of um, some of the complexity we were dealing with to start off with. This is the existing roof plan. I think you can see there's 10 separate roof elements, planes on this building. And for a building that is largely a bungalow that was, um, so that was a lot. They're putting a lot of effort into that roof, a lot of heat loss. And this was the early plan. Rationalize out all those different levels and make it much easier to wrap in insulation. I think we've ended up with a couple more planes than that, but um, that's the kind of general principle of what we were aiming to do. 
So once you've managed to rationalize the envelope where you can, the next thing, um, so staying with that kind of the first principle, the continuous thermal envelope, what we're looking at doing now is wrapping the building. Now, as you saw with St. Sophia's, we don't have a beautiful historic facade that needed to be retained. So our plan was very much wrap the building externally with insulation. This is the kind of best option for an NFIT project where you can do it because it protects the building fabric it keeps the fabric warm which means you don't have any problems of interstitial condensation um, and it's it's easy to do on the outside because you're not having to meet junctions with internal um, partitions and walls and things floors on retrofits are notoriously tricky because it's very difficult to get underneath them so you tend to be working on top of them so we will be insulating over the top of the beam and block floors um, which means that we're restricted in terms of um, how much insulation we can put in because of the internal head height in the building. But we'll go into that in a little bit more detail and um, when we look at, uh, um, I'm going to show you one detail around that kind of perimeter junction in a little bit. But I wanted to show this slide because this is showing some data that we just took out of the Pacifiers planning package really early on. It was one of the first um, things we really did was model the existing building in the pacifies planning package to see where the existing heat losses were coming from. So these are all paired. So this first pair was looking at the existing roof and what we were going to propose to do to it um, back at stage two. Then you've got a ventilation losses, so that's air leakage. Then you've got the existing walls, windows and floor. And this very quickly showed us where our key target area needed to be to get value out of this retrofit. It was the existing roof. That's where most of our losses were. Then losses through the uncontrolled ventilation, so the drafts, then the walls, then the windows, then the floor. And you can see that more or less in terms of where we targeted the energy reduction, it coincided with where the greatest losses were. So it's really useful as a tool to help you make some key decisions about what you're going to be doing and how far and deep you're going to be going with your fabric improvements. Okay. So um if we're moving on now from that first principle, we'll look at thermal bridge free design next um, and how we go about trying to get as close as we can to this in an NFIT. So unfortunately, I don't have time today to go into detail um, of all the different retrofit construction details we have at St. Sophia. So what I've decided to do is just focus on windows so that I can spend a bit of time talking through the strategy that we have. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through, this is a section drawing, which is looking at the existing building, which is the grey, so that's the internal leaf of the building, and the external leaf, it has a cavity, which means there's a gap between those, and that is filled at the moment loosely with some mineral wool, but it's not very consistent. Um, so that will be extracted and a new cavity fill of EPS beads will be, be injected into that wall. And then we're going to be making it airtight on the outside, and then we're going to be adding our insulation. The windows, um, are being moved out from their current where they currently sit back in the cavity out to the front line of the building and I'm going to talk through um, now why why we do this and we've got a couple of things that's sort of worth noting on the drawing so this little block here is an isotop window frame um, which was developed specifically to use around windows where external wall insulation is being used sorry these are pictures are a little grainy they're the ones I could get from the website um, but it's just basically like a it's a um, it's a product which is structural, but it's got a good thermal performance, basically. And that's it in use there. So you put it around the window. The external insulation here is shown in the green, so you can see that coming and kind of butting up um, to that, which is exactly what the proposal is um, at Sensifies. And then, of course, there's always challenges. Nothing's ever simple. So we do have blind boxes which need to get um, installed in front of some of the windows. And it's, you can't fix that directly into the mineral wool insulation, which is the external wall insulation system being used for this project. So we're using um, compact foam, which is another product, a bit like uh, the previous one, which is a product which has got good thermal performance, but it, you can use it a bit like timber and you can screw directly into it. So it's a really good product to use in localized areas like this. It's, it's expensive, so you don't want to just use it everywhere. It's a, it's a tool to get around a problem, it, usually in a retrofit project, where you've got um, a challenge that you need to get over. So that's a really good product to look at to compact foam. Okay, now we just rotate it around. So we're kind of looking down on this in plan now, but again, it's the same levels as we had before. So um, inner leaf, outer leaf, new filled cavity, external wall insulation, and your window. So the old window was located here. So why didn't we just leave it where it was, put the new windows back in the same spot? And the reason is we would have ended up with this thermal bridge um, through that 
line there that you can see. And I'm just going to show you this in a more diagrammatic way, just to make it really clear. Um, this is training material from the warm and carbon light uh, passive house um, training material for contractors and also the passive house designer course. But this shows really clearly what we're talking about. So if you imagine that's the existing wall at Synth Files, it's now just shown as a single block and that window sits in there. And you've got that external insulation that we're putting on the outside and that window's been left further back in the construction. And you can see very clearly that thermal bridge. In that scenario, the heat loss through that nice expensive triple glaze window is 1.46 watts per Kelvin. The number doesn't really matter, but it's just to show you that um, it compared to the installation value. So the amount of heat you're losing from around that window because it's been installed in the wrong location is 1.41 watts per kelvin so and that's the for standard window so this the one that's analyzed here is 1.2 meters by 1.4 very typical so what we're saying is you've got a very expensive product that everyone spent a lot of time specifying and a lot of money procuring and because it's been installed in the incorrect location you're losing as much heat from around the window as you are through the window so that makes no sense when you're installing these expensive products you need to make sure that you're getting full use of them so this is the idealized scenario. So you've got that uh, existing wall again, shown in orange, and then you've got the insulation um, on the outside here. And this time the window's being pushed out to almost the same location we have at St. Sophia's. And in this case, that installation heat loss is at zero. So all the performance of that window is, is in the building. You're getting all the money out of the, the product specification. And that's what you want to be getting um, with everything you specify. But we're just looking at windows uh, to show an example. So going back to the um, sense of fire solution, you can see that again. So if you imagine this section there, uh, this section here is that orange um, section from before. This is the insulation. We pulled that window out to that front edge um, with that uh, specialist product to hold it there in place. And how we calculate our um, the heat loss is called a, a psi value calculating it through that junction. I'm just going to show you. It's done with very simple two-dimensional modeling. It's done in-house at Hampson Baron and Smith. This is not really challenging. Anyone who's working on pacifiers projects really should be able to do this kind of simple two-dimensional thermal modeling. And this is what it looks like when you run the calculation. So you set an outside temperature of 20, inside of zero, and it will work out for you what the heat loss is. And again, on this installation detail, it simplifies the heat loss was down at zero. So you really are getting the full um, optimized performance out of that product. Okay, so I don't have that long left. I'm just going to show one more detail, just because I feel like the perimeter of a retrofit so that junction where the building meets the ground is one of the most challenging junctions that you have in a retrofit project so i just wanted to show what we've got here at St. Sophia's. um so we had as as i mentioned before this is the, this is a section again so this is the wall coming through that's the existing floor all in gray and all the new installations in yellow so we've got that external wall insulation which is continuing down the red line here is actually our air tightness which we're going to talk about next and then you've got the floor, the existing floor, the insulation on top. And again, the air tightness sits up here on top. But as you can see, we've got a bit of a gap between the air tightness over here and the air tightness over here. We've got a thermal gap and an air tightness gap. So we'll talk about how we're bridging that from an air tightness point of view in a minute. Um, but from a thermal point of view, you can't really eliminate that thermal bridge unless you were able to undercut the wall and put insulation in there which is just not practical so there's a residual thermal bridge there almost always is in retrofit projects and here it's not 0.21 watts per um, linear meter per kelvin and i think that what's just important to realize is that there's going to be these thermal bridges but you need to calculate them so they can go into your design software the phpp so that you know how much energy that building is going to use and the rigor of passive house requiring this level of analysis means that you're able to tell your clients how much energy the building is actually going to use and you're able to carry out calculations to see well there is a thermal bridge here is there a moisture problem at this location here? Do we need to have an insulated um, skirting board or something to make sure we don't have mold and condensation at this point? Okay, I'm gonna move on to um, the next principle, which is our draft free or air tightness. So the images on the left, um, the top one's great. But that was when we did an air pressure test at St. Sophia's and we filled the solum underneath the building with smoke and it just billowed up through the floors, through the skirting boards, behind the windows. It was 
yeah, it was very fascinating to see what air paths the existing building had. Um, the image underneath shows where an, a window is being put into an existing building. Uh, you can't really see, but that is a cavity wall, which a piece of membranes um, taped across and then taped back to the existing brickwork before the plaster comes and completes on this one, the airtightness line, which was internal. Um, okay. So the strategy at St. Sophia's is, as I mentioned when we were looking at that perimeter detail, it's an external airtightness layer, just like it's external insulation. And that is simpler than trying to do it as the internal face of the building. It's still, even though it's external, it's still inside of the insulation because we're sticking all the insulation on after this. But um, doing as internal line would have been really tricky because every time we met an internal wall, we'd have had to strip it back and try to get an airtight seal onto that. So it's, there's a lot more chance for error. Um, the airtightness on the walls then is just basically a, applied to the existing building and it wraps up um, over the existing structure onto the roof and it's picked up at that point and then on the inside it comes in on the floor and we just have to stitch it together in that location I was mentioning. So the strategy for applying it to the existing walls is pretty straightforward. It's stripping off the damaged and poor conditioned render and applying a liquid applied airtightness membrane. Um, we're looking at purple passive but there are other products as well that do the same thing. This is then supplemented with the Proclima range of membranes and tapes which are um, compliant with using on pacifies projects. They are all kind of have accelerated age testing so you know they're still going to be working in 100 years time um, and that's just where we have connections. So basically where there's a new extension that's coming in with new um, materials we'll need to tape that to the existing building to make sure there's not gaps. But the challenge on this project really was because there's cavity walls it's closing the cavity and that is a challenge you will find if you're working on any cavity wall buildings it's always a, a challenge um, especially where you've got your tightness on the outside um, of the walls and the inside of the floor because you just have to stitch it together somehow so we looked at a few options for how to bridge over the cavity to join together the air tightness on the outside walls and the inside floor. And we were introduced to this innovative approach by Anne Thorne Architects. Um, they'd used this um, sort of airtight foam to do this particular job on a large certified NFIT project. They drilled 150 mil apart in key places where the airtight layer needed to cross the cavity. Um, so effectively, they were building an airtight bridge across the cavity. They didn't know at the time whether it was going to fully work, but they tested it and it worked really well. Um, and it was airtightness expert, actually, Paul Jennings and Liam Schofield, who had pioneered the approach, and they'd passed on their experience to Anne Thorne Architects, and we are now picking up the baton at St. Sophia's. So while it's still an innovative approach, there's a good legacy of success with the approach, so we'll certainly be monitoring to see how, how it all performs. Um, for this project, one option being looked at in terms of the actual product is a product called Walltight by BASF. In particular, it's being looked at because it doesn't have shrinkage. That's a really important thing. We need to make sure that it's not going to shrink back um, over time. But there's other products, um, again, that can do similar jobs. Okay, so another key pacifies principle is solar gain, both its optimization in winter and control in summer to prevent overheating. So we had loads of rationalization of the fenestration at St. Sophia's. We removed lots of large east-facing windows which were causing excessive overheating in the existing classrooms um, as they are now and also in our model we could see that it was going to remain a problem. So this was an IES model of the school which was being used to assess the shading options. While the pacifies package can be used to do uh, overheating assessments, um, when you have non-domestic or particularly complex buildings it's a good idea to have a dynamic model so you can go into more detail and really understand the overheating. So the original design as you can see here was actually for these freestanding breeze soleil as it felt like that was a pretty simple option um, that would have the least impact on the thermal envelope and avoid bridging the insulation to fix back uh, to the existing building. If it had been a new build actually the window reveals would have been able to take the extra weight of the cantilevering breeze soleil um, but the existing walls in this building could not do that so this was the initial sort of Reba stage two approach. However, those kind of original freestanding breeze soleil actually had quite a lot of cost knock-on effects. So there was issues with the foundation pad, pad, pads affecting existing drainage um, and also existing retaining walls because it is on a sloped site. So at Reba stage four, the team investigated um, whether that point thermal bridge through those steel connections could allow that cantilevered breeze soleil um, 
or whether there'd be comfort or energy issues. Uh, and they also then look to see what the additional cost of the special thermal breaks would be compared to the savings from not having to disrupt the foundations and retaining wall. And I'm not going to dwell on this detail because we're a little bit tight on time, um, but just to say that um, this is the section that's the existing wall insulation in the cavity, and then this is the breeze soleil basically, and this is the specialist um, thermal break coming through the new external wall insulation just there. And this is an example of the kind of a connector. This is a shoot connector that the HBS team were looking at. But without these kind of specialist products, um, this wouldn't really have been an option because you'd have steel coming straight through the structure. And for most part, thermal bridges in a pacifier can be calculated using fairly simple 2D thermal modeling, which um, HBS were doing in-house. However, as soon as you get steel into a construction, you're probably going to be looking at 3D modeling, um, and then you probably need a specialist. So Nick Devlin, an industry specialist, carried out the analysis, and it showed that actually it would work for the project. And it resulted in savings both in cost and carbon because there was a reduction in steel work, um, no concrete required for new foundation pads, no redirecting of underground drainage, and the existing retaining wall could be retained rather than having to be demolished and rebuilt. So design development there on the shading options. And the final passivized principle um, that I want to cover is just the, the fresh air. So the super healthy filtered fresh air with heat recovery, um, which really provides those optimum conditions we talked about inside the school for learning and comfort. Absolutely essential on all passive house and interfit buildings. Ooh. Well, there we go. I thought my screen had stopped. Uh, so generally at St. Sophia's, we have decentralized MVHR units throughout uh, with operable windows for summer purge comfort and also the use of panel vents, uh, which allows secure night ventilation to all classrooms. We investigated centralized MVHR for the school, but the constraints of the existing building, in particular the floor to ceiling height in that central spine corridor, meant that it just wasn't an option. You couldn't get the ducts across the school and also be able to walk down the corridor. Every school, of course, will be different in this regard, and there are other things to consider beyond space constraints about how the school is actually going to be used. So how breakout spaces are working, how much free flow there is, how often classroom doors are shut. Uh, the unit we're intending to use at the school is a Pacify certified unit by Drexel and Vice uh, called the Aero School 600, I think, and it's specially designed to fit into teaching walls for other classroom furniture. I couldn't get the teaching wall photograph. I know I've got one somewhere, but I put in this one showing you a bit of classroom furniture with that integrated in. So it's a very neat solution. And if we were in Germany, it would be 80% full installation funded um, by the German government because um, during COVID last summer, they announced that they would provide 80% government funding for all schools to install these. So if anyone from the Scottish government is on the call, please, please instigate a similar um, process here. Okay, I'm not going to spend long on domestic hot water. I have one slide on this, but I just included it as I didn't want to not mention it. I want to highlight that domestic hot water strategies are really important. So in low energy buildings, when so much effort has been, has been put into the fabric of the building and reducing heat demand so much, the residual demand for hot water can actually form quite a large portion of your overall energy need. So the general strategy at St. Sophia's is to use point of use water heaters. So this drastically reduces the distribution losses, which would occur if water was literally being pumped all the way around the school all the time. And there's other benefits to that kind of approach too for low energy buildings. So you get reduced heat losses through the pipes in summer, um, which could otherwise lead to issues around summer overheating. Um, so domestic hot water not to be forgotten in a passive house project. And these are my last couple of slides now. I think we've actually done okay on timing. Um, so this is kind of like, what difference does all this effort, attention to detail um, and skill required from your contracting team actually give you? So this is the original scenario since Sophia's. This is modeled uh, heat loss and gains. So the losses on the left, each color represents a different part of the building. So for example, walls or windows or roofs. And on the right, you've got free gains from the sun, free gains from all the kids in the school and the teachers, um, but the rest of your gains have to be supplied by your heating system. And as you can see here with the existing building, it's absolutely massive. So all the work that we're proposing to do at St. Sophia's is reducing those losses so significantly, shrinking them right down, that actually the solar gains over here and the internal gains from the students um, and teachers in the school actually represent a huge part of what the school needs over the course of the year. And the heating demand it's just this uh, small fraction up at the top here, which is 24, 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. 
Okay, and on that note, I'm just going to pretty much close up. I want to leave these three references for you to have a look at. So, Passive House Retrofit in the UK, I mentioned at the start. We also have a Passive House Benefits Guide at the Passive House Trust, which is really good if you're putting together a kind of business case or a proposal that you want to discuss um, with a school to show the benefits that a Passive House can bring to them. Uh, then we, there's also the Letty Climate Emergency Retrofit Guide, which again is really good. And it also gives you other options. If you can't go all the way to Enerfit, there's, it's not just don't do anything. There's other sort of stepping stones um, that you could aim for as an alternative. And if you do want to find out more, do visit the Passive House Trust website. There's loads of free information, free videos, um, and access to case studies if you do need a bit of inspiration. And on that note, I am going to finish up and I'm going to hand over to James, who's going to talk a little bit more about the embodied carbon implications of what we're doing on circular economy. Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Um, great. Um, oh. And hopefully now see my screen as well. Um, that was great, Sarah. Um, I'm going to talk about um, basically a, a carbon and materials study that we carried out at Useful Projects to support the, um, the scheme. A little bit about uh, Useful Projects and myself. Um, we are part of a business called the Useful Simple Trust, which uh, consists of a number of built environment consultancies. I spend most of my time working in one of those, Expedition Engineering, for a structural engineering practice. And we also have a sustainability consultancy arm, useful projects under which we delivered uh, this piece of work, Sensifiers. Um, the, our role was not commissioned directly by East Ayrshire Council, and we were actually approached by Zero Waste Scotland, who were keen to support Sensifiers wherever possible, to basically provide some additional value and guidance to the in situ project team. Sarah and the team at Hampson Baron Smith, the project engineers, um, to think to get more information and more insight into uh, the materials impacts of the retrofit proposal. Um, and Zero Waste Scotland were basically funding that in part because of the project's role as a pathfinder project for the net zero public sector building standard recently released by the Scottish Futures Trust that um, Alistair has already described. Um, the and in order to deliver that piece of work from Zero Waste Scotland, we, we partnered with a, a Glasgow-based uh, environmental practice, Green Belt Environment, who were very helpful in, in completing this bit of work. Um, and what, what I guess our role was, or what we were interested in exploring on this unique and innovative project, was how clients and design teams can get better information in order to make better decisions about what they do on their projects. Alice has already given an overview of um, some of the decisions and thinking that the uh, East Ayrshire Council were having to make as a client on the project, looking at sort of shallow rather than deep retrofits, potentially looking at options to relocate or rebuild the school. And the team had already done a great job of, of taking that conversation beyond cost and programme, as, as most typical projects would do to think about the operational carbon and operational running cost impact of the scheme, some of the measures that, that Sarah has already described, as well as the impact that um, any more significant uh, rebuild option might have on the community served by the school um, and how to, how to keep that public service running. And I guess that's, that's wonderful and, and a damn sight better than a lot of projects. But, um, but it doesn't capture everything. And what we were hoping to explore in the scheme was, was what else is important and what, what really is the value that a project is trying to drive. Expanding those, those measures and those uh, objectives out to a wider scope, including embodied carbon, which I'll talk about quite a bit in this talk, materials and how they can be reused and recycled and, and, and delivered appropriately, but also other features, including social value, economic value, um, human value, um, health and well-being, Sarah's already talked about in part, and how we make kind of balanced decisions based on that information, particularly when some of those elements are quite difficult to quantify, measure, report on. So this was a bit of an experiment in that regard, and obviously that ties into other frameworks of thinking about sustainable objectives, including the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I'll talk about some of those as part of these, uh, this talk. 
So um, we were we were brought on board during our IPA stage three um, to support the team with basically better information and insight. Um, and what we decided to do in conjunction with Zero Waste Scotland was develop a, a value framework for sustainability aspirations on the project. And that was to cover carbon, both in operation, as I think Sarah's already very well described, but also embodied carbon in materials, to think about how we specify, deliver, design those materials to promote circular economy objectives, which is obviously a key focus of Zero Waste Scotland, thinking about how we can source responsibly, design our waste, um, design our, the, the retrofit solutions so that all the material value can be extracted at the end. Um, to also, and then to look at a wider set of objectives. And for this, we took some inspiration from a project that's actually moved on in the two years since our work on Sensifiers, which is the Construction Innovation Hub Value Toolkit. There's a lot of good information on the web about that. And what that proposes is that particularly clients um, develop uh, frameworks for value on their projects that consider a four capitals approach, thinking about natural capital, social capital, human cap capital and production capital. And they use that as a way of making sure that their decisions are achieving the aspirations of a scheme. So different clients will have different perspectives on what's valuable. If you're spending a lot of public money on a school in Scotland, there's maybe different things you want to think about in terms of the local economy to a, a private development project. Uh, as a, a kind of clear example, um, and also to help kind of drive decisions that are uh, maximizing that value rather than just the thing that's easiest to quantify. Um, and that that um, scheme, which is, is is really good, and I'd recommend you have a read, wasn't really available, but had been proposed in 2020. So we kind of took some inspiration for this to develop the, the value framework on the right hand side. And as part of that, we agreed that we would look at natural, social, and human factors in the materials choices that the, the design team were looking at. Specifically in this case, through Reba stage three, when the team was starting to get into specific, specifying actual things from different suppliers. And I'll talk a bit at the end about how that, that panned out. Um, just to focus on carbon to start with, um, Sarah's given a brief introduction of the scheme already to kind of put that into uh context in terms of what we were trying to measure and, and appraise on the project um, the the final proposals include extending out on one elevation of the building to increase space and improve form factor and the elements that Sarah described and in a sense the works that are being done there are like a new build but just for a part of the building so you've got new foundations new walls superstructure roofs etc and then across the rest of the building we have the external wrapping that Sarah's described new windows and doors filled cavity walls so a kind of facade works across the full scale of the scheme and then effectively 100 percent the building services on the building uh, were to be replaced from one standard so i guess the way you could think about that is compared to a new build scheme we're maybe doing 30 percent of the structural works that we would do on a normal building 100 percent the mep works and 80 percent of the fabric works let's say and what i was going to deliver in operational carbon terms was Sarah's described a 90% reduction in space heating demand, an 85% reduction in running costs, obviously very important, and similarly an 85% reduction in operational carbon. And that was a real prize, I guess, from our perspective on a sustainability front was this kind of 30 tonnes of carbon saving year on year on year through the dramatic space heating reductions that the NFIT approach gives, as well as in this case, a transition from dirty energy, the existing building mainly around the gas boiler, to cleaner energy or at least um, zero carbon ready energy in the form of electricity through the heat pumps on the, on the proposal. Um, so that gives us the kind of operational carbon side of things. And then from an embodied carbon perspective, so thinking about the impacts of the materials and the stuff that we're doing in the retrofit, the value in that we considered in appraising that was to a, be really confident as designers and clients that the interventions that we're proposing pay off and deliver the carbon savings intended. So Sarah described a, a, um, the window frame detail, for instance, that needed basically some more stuff and definitely more design thinking than a, an alternative option. And we want to make sure that the works we're doing there really deliver the uh, heat, uh, space heating and operational carbon savings that are um, sought. We want to be able to 
set robust targets that hold us to account on the project in line with good practice and with other good projects and also use that information to be really thoughtful and targeted about the products that we specify and the design decisions that we make. Um, so what we did was we basically um, carried out an appraisal of the READ3 scheme as well as some options that were being considered and developed a carb embodied carbon footprint for the project. And we also sought to develop a project specific set of targets based on external good practice. It's quite hard for a retrofit because every project is very different and there's a lot less case studies available than there are for new build schools or new build buildings in general. So for this project, what we did was we basically took uh, an external benchmark for a new build school and we just prorated everything by the works that were being done. So as I said, kind of 30% of structural works for new build, 100% MEP works, etc., to develop a set of um, project specific targets for the scope of works being proposed as sensifiers. It's not super scientific, but we found it a helpful way of thinking about what we were expecting the impacts to be of the project. And then we also did that bottom up estimate of what the embodied carbon impacts uh, were of the proposal. And what that uh, exercise showed is that a kind of whole building level, and I'll go into a bit more detail in some specific areas, was that at a stroke by East Ayrshire and Hampson Baron Smith taking the decision to undertake a deep retrofit rather than a new build scheme to passive house standards they saved 40 percent of the embodied carbon of a new build at a stroke and then already before our involvement and in our kind of deeper investigation into these specific material choices they'd saved roughly 17 percent of the embodied carbon compared to a typical 2020 new build school through the material choices being made so things like environmentally friendly insulation products, um, the approach taken to the internal finishes, et cetera. So there's already a lot of low carbon materials being proposed on the scheme. Um, but actually that, that still fell some way short of a 2030 target, read 23 target for schools, for instance. Um, and there are lots of good reasons for that, including some of the complexities of the existing building, existing levels, challenges like that existing form factor of the roof that mean that you're actually providing a lot of fabric for the square meterage etc but gave us a good way of holding the project to account on those even though we were starting off on a really good uh, footing we weren't going to sit on our laurels of the project and say oh we're great uh, we could we could keep holding ourselves to account and what that showed was that the retrofit proposals would have a carbon impact of about 160 tons up front in doing the works and in running the heat pumps and refurbishing and repairing the building, there'd be a kind of running in body carbon of about four tons a year. We can compare that with the 30 ton a year saving from the NFIT refurbishment on operational carbon sense. And if you look at those two numbers together, what you find is that the embodied carbon of the retrofit proposals would pay back in its in operational carbon saving in around seven to 10 years. The around, partly because um, what we're relying on here is the um, operational carbon intensity of the electricity that we're proposing to use as sensifiers, which is decarbonizing very rapidly, but is fundamentally uncertain. And um, anyone who's involved in uh, providing energy statements for planning will know there's quite a lot of difference in, in what those estimates are. So on this chart on the right, you'll see the uh, carbon payback period if we use the carbon factors that are currently in um, building regulations SAT 10 and then if we take the kind of real estimate that National Grid are providing in their future energy scenarios for how fast they think they're decarbonizing electricity basically is performing better than building regs is pr predicting and therefore the building will pay back sooner because we've transitioned off of gas and onto electric. Um, and then we looked in detail about where that embodied carbon impact was. Um, we developed a kind of hotspot analysis of different areas of the scheme and kind of predictably, predictably because we weren't doing very much structural works and we were doing a lot of services works, the services was very important. But I think what was really useful for the team to understand was that actually 25% of the impact of the project was in one thing, which was the spec of the heat pumps, basically. The refrigerants in those heat pumps um, are a, a, are a greenhouse gas basically um, a varying impact depending on the specification of the heat pump itself and heat pumps inevitably leak to some degree and that leakage was proving one of the major carbon footprint impacts of the scheme so by 
looking at the specification of those heat pump units from a high global warming potential refrigerant to a low global warming potential refrigerant, um, the scheme could make a further 15 to 20% saving in carbon and really help to identify some key specification choices that were being used. And we took that a bit further, as I say, to look at some wider metrics. And within the study, we looked at nine key things that the team were about to specify as they went into procurement. Um, looked at floor insulation, render systems, centralized versus decentralized MBHR, as Sarah has already described, flooring options. And we looked at each of these specific elements on a carbon basis, but also appraised them in terms of responsible sourcing in the sector economy, as well as that, those wider sustainability measures, human, natural, social capital that we've touched on already. I can't go into a lot of detail on that, but kind of similar to Sarah, if we just go on to a, a kind of specific example of window frames as an example of that. We looked at for the team, basically for each of those various elements, three options which were kind of meant to be what they would normally do, what would definitely be the cheapest or uh, value engineering option um, on a typical project and also what might be the kind of best in class. And so for window frames, we looked at timber aluminium composite windows, which are very common on passive house projects, uh, traditional new PVC windows, which as you might imagine have a, a higher embodied carbon impact uh, and also use uh, petrochemicals and then recycled UPVC windows as a potential option for a uh, low carbon circular material. And we appraised each of those three options uh, against uh, their embodied carbon per kind of functional unit of window, um, a variety of metrics related to responsible sourcing, recycled material in the circular economy, and these wider factors. And just to give a brief insight into that, what we were really doing there was just asking a series of questions against those, those different environmental capitals um, and giving them a, a kind of red, amber, green score. It is a real challenge here that there isn't a huge amount of information available and it can be very laborious and time consuming to dig into getting lots of environmental data. There are good sources for summary information, such as the Green Guide to Specification, but we basically looked at natural factors, including um, yeah, air quality and water water use uh, factors associated with each of those three options. We looked at the suppliers that were being considered for those and how they met various social criteria, including equality legislation, support of community enterprise, local sourcing, etc. We looked at human factors relating to safety, skills development, as well as some of the clean air, sound insulation issues that Sarah's already described and the impact they might have on education and then also a variety of circular metrics, including recycled content, ability to be easily disassembled and recycled. Um, the hope was that this uh, balanced scorecard approach would give, if not the equivalent amount of quantitative data that we're now developing on a carbon perspective, but uh, a kind of ability for the project team to, to make those more considered judgments rather than necessarily that just happening on a, a quantity surveyors VE schedule, for instance, or um, or things like that, and and allow the also clients such as East Ayrshire to make an informed decision about what they were trying to achieve with some of these more detailed um, design choices as well, given their buying impact. Um, that's basically me, uh, and then I think we're going to move on to the Q and A next. Um, to wrap up, um, the passive house retrofit of sense fires was affordable, viable, and practical. The design team did a huge amount of work to, sh to build a business case for how that could measure up against options that were maybe seen to be lower risk or, or easier. And that was heavily driven by good work of Hampson Baron Smith on the operational carbon side at the beginning of the project and then supported later on by, by the, the further kind of data and appraisal that we were able to bring through the later project stages. Those later stages are still absolutely key and in order to deliver the initial promise of a low carbon retrofit, you need to keep making sustainable decisions and cascading those through the design, specification, procurement, build. Um, and having better information is a really useful way of managing that. Um, and that's a key recommendation of the net zero public sector building standard uh, that the project was a pathfinder for. And um, there is enough information now and it is 
practical and, and, and achievable for clients to be much more involved in driving value in a broader sense than cost in, the, in their projects. And we'd really encourage that in conjunction with uh, strong certification systems like Enefit that, that clients um, try and build a, a way of, of looking at those wider value impacts as well. Um, thank you very much. I think that's me. Wow, thank you so much. Um, yeah, just so much information and so many questions and so little time. So I think what we'll do is go to the next poll. Um, that is when you're carrying out an inner fit retrofit, what measure should be considered first? Is it the insulation, the windows, the air tightness? or should it be the MVHR system? And hopefully you'll have gleaned from the presentations what might be your first consideration. Of course, all must be considered when we're doing an inner fit retrofit. Um, but even, yeah, just from the, the speakers, the huge amount of collaboration and investment that's, that's gone into this project um, is definitely something that we can learn from um, in whatever project that you're involved in. So. Yeah, we can just get a quick poll answer to that and we'll go through the answers. Yes, I think we all know it's fabric first. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that. And thanks to Sarah Lewis and thanks to James Parker. Thanks to Alistair. Unfortunately, he had to leave, but we have Magnus here from the council. Um, I'm not sure if his camera is working, but he should be able to chat um, and he can answer any questions. So I'm just going to go. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. So I'm just going to go to the first question that we have. Um, which is a question on PSI. Just going to get up to that on the side here. Yeah, question from Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. With details that have a PSI value higher than what would be for a new build, how is the surface temperature considered to ensure comfort and condensation? Um, either Sarah or James, just put your hand up. I'm not sure who would be the best Probably person me. to answer that. <laughs> Um, so the actual surface temperature requirements is the same, whether it's a new build um, or a retrofit. Uh, what the, the reason you would end up with a slightly higher value in a retrofit is just because you literally can't eliminate them and it all adds to your heating demand. But that's really the reason why a passive house building is not aiming for 25 like we are at Sensor Fires. It's aiming for 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. So you're getting an extra allowance on your overall heat demand, but you're not allowed to introduce condensation risks or mold risks. So um, I think the limit for passive house surface temperatures is around 16, 17 degrees. Um, you're not going to get mold or condensation unless those surface temperatures in the UK typically drop to around 13 degrees. So you've still got a good tolerance. Um, to have a robust uh, to have a robust detail what you will find though is because you are having scenarios where there's a higher psi value than you would want um your certifiers are almost certainly going to ask for that detailed um therm two-dimensional therm modeling so they can see those iso bars and they can see what the surface temperature is at those critical junctions so it'll be um proof gathering during that process so it's yeah part of the analysis but it, it's not an allowance to go to any risky Points. So I hope that answers your question, Patrick. Um, we have another question from Will. When modelling the existing and proposed buildings, did you use design PHP or in conjunction with PHPP or PHPP alone? There's so many acronyms, aren't there? Um, so, so PHPP is the Passive House um, Planning Package. So that's the main tool that everyone uses to design a Passive House building. Design PH is effectively a plugin which allows you to build a SketchUp model. And it has, it's quite cool, it has a little toolbar in the SketchUp model. So as you're changing the SketchUp model, you get updates on how the building's performing in SketchUp. But then you can also export that directly into your PHPP and you can have a full PHPP file on the building. Um, this project actually would have been a good one to use Design PH on. We did not. Um, I was doing the modeling and I'm very comfortable with PHPP, so it's just that was the way I did it. But it would have been one that would have worked well actually with Design PH. So you could have done either. They both would work. Uh, the benefit of Design PH um, comes especially when you're used to working in SketchUp because it's, it's a pretty quick way to get feedback on the okay. building performance um, and the shading because shade put inputs, inputting shading into PHP is quite challenging. And design mm. PHP allows you to model the buildings around you and the trees and whatever else is around, and it inputs that data. So it's, it's quite a good way to model shading, complex shading scenarios. 
badly. So yeah, use both. Excellent. Um, question from Derek, and of course like we knew we were going to get a question on cost. Um, is Alistair saying that the cost of providing an infit building is in the, is the same as a normal refurbishment? What, what's normal refurbishment? I mean, a refurbishment could be a lick of paint, it could be new floors, it could be new windows. It, you know, it, no. I mean, I think when Alistair was talking, Magnus was coming, but what the budget that the school had to do this project, or that the council had to do this project with the school, was based on demolishing the school and building a new one. Because that was one of the that was that was one of the, the options which was available, and that was priced. But that was not what the community around the school wanted. They wanted to retain the school in the location it was, and that's why the retrofit discussion actually probably started. So it's really the probably the parent council here. I think might even be on the call today, and the school. I think Liz, the head teacher, might even be here. You know, it was them and their love of that school that probably drove so much of the beginning stages of this project. Um, and it was taking that budget and being like, can we actually do a retrofit to basically get a new building with the old fabric? So that that's that was maybe the comparison Alistair was making. Sarah, it's yeah, Magnus and I think Derry. Magnus. Yeah, it's Magnus Derry, East Ayrshire Council. I would just add to that that you know it's not a refurbishment, it, it's a retrofit of an existing building which retains the sort of substructure and the superstructure. But to all intents and purposes, it'll look and feel like a new building. Um, we also had, obviously, inherit with an existing building issues with accessibility and layout, and some of the new build aspects are assisting with that in terms of incorporating a lift core to help with accessibility and um, other areas which improve the building form, but also improve the layout within to modernise the school. Um, it's worth also noting that in terms of LEAP funding, they're off for Passive House or for Enerfit, they're offering the same levels of funding that they are for New Build. And almost the expectation is that the, the cost will be similar to New Build cost on these. Um, so so I, th I think it's yeah. just important to realise, you know, it's not just a refurbishment. No, it's bigger than that. It's, it's much, much bigger. It's not, you like to say, it's almost like getting a, a, a brand new building. Um, okay, I'm just going to check and see if we've got any further. Yes, question for James. Was there a requirement for PV panels for the project to deal with unregulated power? Any key challenges associated with the existing infrastructure, such as slab penetrations for drainage, where these insulated and taped internally above the existing floor finish? So Sarah might want to follow up. Um, I guess to be clear, there was an, uh, a full design team, and we were effectively just helping support them. So I haven't, for my sins, been involved in the detailed delivery of, of uh, sensor fires. Um, it, there was no this project. While it's a pathfinder for the net zero public sector building standard, it isn't um, required to be a net zero operational building and therefore there isn't a huge amount of renewable provisions proposed on the scheme um, and I don't believe Sarah that there is PV proposed within the it, retrofit rules. It was, it was in and out of the project a few times we wanted to do it but the budget <laughs> had to be focusing on the fabric because the so I think and the I think Magnus can correct me if I'm wrong I think the current stance is that we're putting in connections so future provision will be there the loadings being checked so that the loading works and pb might become a later stage but for now the budget's being used to do the fabric and then the the pv can be added but it's kind of planned for um, and in terms of unregulated emissions um, that all forms part of the passive house calculation so there's no power that's used in the building that's if it's power if it's attached to the building we include it in our calculations so anything so if it's a light that's on the outside of the building but it's attached it's all within the the calculations and everything is accounted for down to how many times we think someone's going to be using a kettle in the staff room we can, we budget everything so wow. it is unregulated in the sense that regulated and unregulated uh and power use but we certainly account for it and it is um, included in the total the total calculations for the project. Yeah. We're really conscious. We're, we're focused on the school's bills, not not what building exists is looking. Exactly, we're all about what the <laughs> end users to pay. Um, and uh, yeah, the other question around services and um, yes, the slab insulation was there challenges in terms of the existing infrastructure. 
I think at high level, Sarah, it's fair to say that because of the external wrapping, what problems that you might traditionally, challenges you might traditionally have on a retrofit with, with some of those issues were eased to some extent by the fact you're providing a large amount of additional roofing insulation and the partial new build on plan also gave opportunities for servicing the building in the tidier areas than, than might otherwise have been needed to be done. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, where penetrations do come through any of the air tightness flares, whether it's the, the floor or the walls or the roof, um, everything gets sealed. So there's specialist products that you get, like grommets or tapes that you can you can do that. So it's it's relatively easy to manage. Um, that's one of those things where the contractors really come into their own when they have their sequencing and site management processes to make sure that they have a schedule of any penetration which is going to be th going through the critical air tightness um, or insulation layers and that they follow the specifications and everything gets checked off and that's the sort of thing that the certifiers would want to see as well. Absolutely. Um, it was mentioned it was possible to specify Interfit within the overall project budget. What was the budget for the project? I don't know, Magnus, if you have can answer that for us? Yeah, it's, uh, the, the build cost circa three million. Um, how was the project procured and are the energy carbon target targets contractual? That's for Magnus. Yeah, the, the energy targets are not contractual, um, although we have actually managed to get LEAP funding as a bit of a pathfinder for the project off the back of its innovative approach to, um, you know, sort of um, energy conservation and carbon reduction. Um, in terms of what, sorry, what was the other part of the question? It was, sorry, I just sure. scrolled down. Um, where are the contractual and how was the project procure, yeah. procured? It, it's a two-stage procurement process. We felt it was um, important to bring a contractor on early to discuss buildability and how the, the different sort of processes would be handled. So we've, we brought Fleming's on early and it, it's a, a two-stage process where they're going to market test and um, we're going to negotiate a, a final end of position. We're in the process of doing that at the moment. Fantastic. That kind of answers the last question that we've got time for, which is when is the building being handed, completed and handed over? So um, have you got any ideas of timelines on um, completion dates? Yeah, the, the idea is that construction will start into the new year and it, it will um, last for approximately 12 months. So by the end of uh, the following year, it will be should be finished and the school will move back in. Fantastic. And we've got a really nice note from the, the head teacher just saying what a, what a great presentation it was. And she's been really glad to pay their part in reducing their overall carbon. So um, all that remains to, to say is thank you to the audience for being with us. Thank you to our fantastic speakers. It's such a great project to be involved in. We will be feeding back about this project in the future as it runs. So um, keep posted for any future webinars. And yeah, as I say, please give us some feedback and let us know what you thought about our webinar. And yeah, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon.